the descendants of Cain become the idea of curses. The scripture are not full of 19th century racism. They actually reflect John Thompson. John Thompson joining us. Was a former executive board of university chaplains. You're at Harvard. PhD in Egyptology at the University of Pennsylvania. So let me begin with a remark on my title. The church has now said black people are not cursed because of the curse of Cain. We want to make it very clear that we disavow that teaching. Rather than trying to find an answer to why there's a modern ban, I want to go back into the sources and make sure that we're understanding the terminology correctly. Wait, wait. Let's just take some time to understand what a generational curse is. What we're losing is this idea of inheritance. Inheritance. Children inherit the blessings of the kingdom from their parents. We've all come through lineages that have broken the covenant. So I cannot inherit the priesthood from my ancestors because they don't have it to give to me. The way I think it's stated in the Bible is that the whole earth will be smitten with a curse. Curse, right? <laughs> the whole earth. And so that's the good news. There is a way back. The beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ that Joseph Smith restored is it includes the solution, which is that... Rather than trying to find an answer to why there's a modern ban, I want to step back from that for one minute and, and go back into the sources and make sure that we're understanding the terminology correctly. Okay. And if we get the terminology down well, then we can move forward into history and start talking about well, what happened mm. and what is that correct understanding of, of antiquity, right? How does that influence then our dialogue today. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that that's kind of what um, that I was trying to do with this paper or, you know, these ideas. I, I think it does have bearing, a lot of bearing on the question of the modern priesthood and temple ban. But, um, but it really is more about understanding scriptural language, again, and terminology so that we're not bringing assumptions to the table about what these things mean that muddy the waters of our current dialogue. We need to, be, we need to see, see clearly. I, I love Jesus' teachings about how we judge righteous judgment. He says, you know, you remember he talked about the beam in your eye. He says, get the beam out of your eye that you may see clearly. See clearly, then you can do judgment properly. Right, and so what happens is we blind ourselves with our own constructions. It's a, interestingly, it wasn't a tree or a log sticking out of your eye. It's a <laughs> beam. A beam is a man-made, fashioned. Mm. You know, he says you've created your own structures and blinded yourself. Now get those out, and let's see clearly, so that when we judge, we're judging more righteously. And um, and so I think that that. So what I'm trying to do is like, let's get the terminology better, then we can have better discussions about it. So what would you say in that context, right? These man-made beams, perspectives, worldviews, whoever you want to describe it. What are, after reading your paper, there was two main ones that you mentioned. What would you say is the first? Yeah. Well, the first one is that uh, the scriptures are full of racist ideas, especially Joseph Smith's revelations. So the book of Abraham seems to be racist because it's, it's denying people a priesthood based on something their ancestor did. And, and, um, and so people attribute that to racism. Um, and the other side of that coin is that um, people don't wanna see generational curses in scriptures because they, again, they feel that it is racist. And so because they feel it's racist, then we need to like, we need to rest the scriptures. We need to uh, gloss them or we have to somehow uh, reinterpret them or allegorize them so that it's not something that's, you know, painful, right? So it can be, if we understand the terminology correctly, then we understand that it actually isn't racist and it's not unjust because you can be somebody who is cursed even though you did nothing wrong because something that your ancestor did. And so that's, that's, that's a tricky part. It's like a very fine, you know, path to walk between those two ideas. And so, but that's why I think it's important that we understand what does the generational curse actually do? Like, why did they exist? So, so I guess that is the next question. And naturally it would be, right? You could look at both extremes is what I'm understanding you're saying. It could be one way or the other. You're saying, wait, wait, let's just take a step back. Let's actually take some time to understand what a generational curse is, especially from the original context in the text. Yep. And what does that look like? So cursing in, in scripture um, is kind of an interesting idea because it's such a, it's such a negative word, right? To be cursed. And especially to say that 
Um, if something your ancestors did that you're cursed, right? To that, that just sounds unjust, yeah, right, and it sounds wrong. Um, and so people are like, well, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. And so because it seems seems unjust, then it's probably not of God. Yeah. Right? But when we actually go back and again start looking at what's the text saying and what what is the cultural idea of the day. Um, then I think we can make sense of it a little bit better without having to call Joseph Smith racist or without having to rest scripture in such a way that it no longer has the meaning that it actually has. So I'm trying to find this middle path between these two extremes that I think people have created. And I can show this in the Bible as well as in uh, ancient Near East, uh, like ancient Egypt particularly, that, that like you think about Pharaoh's curse, right? We hear about yeah, cursing yeah. in Egypt a lot. We have such a negative idea of what per- cursing means that that we think it's such a harsh word that if it's ever attributed to somebody who didn't do anything wrong, then it's like, yeah, that's not right. Yeah, but but the ancients didn't think that way. They they were okay with saying someone was cursed even if they hadn't done anything wrong. And here's the reason: cursing oftentimes gets associated with the concept of inheritance. So I will read this. That's okay. So, so there's a decree in ancient Egypt of Demej Yibtawe, where it indicates that the wrongdoer, so the person who does wrong or who's being threatened with a curse, the wrongdoer would not only lose his own possessions, but he also would lose the possessions that belonged to his father. Mm. In other words, they're being cut off from the family inheritance, mm. right, is the curse. In the chapel of Meru or Bebi in uh, Saqqara, there's a curse that indicates that the recipient's heirs will not be able to receive any inheritance and establish their own homes, hmm. right? And so there's tons of examples like that where, where, where if you come into my tomb and you do something wrong, I'm going to curse you. But the curse is that you're going to lose your inheritance from your fathers or that your children won't be able to inherit anymore what you've had because you've lost the inheritance. It's an actual thing that you have. And if you don't have it, then they don't have it. Right. So yeah, that's, it just makes sense. If you don't have something to give your children, they don't have it. They don't have it. Yeah, the and consequence. It, they didn't it. do anything wrong. Yeah, right? the children aren't to blame, but it's just the natural consequence of breaking whatever rule that you broke. Right? If you did desecrated a tomb, curse upon you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And so, but um, but so this idea of the importance of inheritance um, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think, is something that that. We've kind of lost because we don't have a family structure of um, of a kingdom, right? Mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. we're very independently structured, especially in America, you know, United States of America. And we, I mean, we do have inheritances, obviously, in our lives. We do inherit trust funds, whatever. right? Right. So we can understand it to that degree, but we don't think about um, eternal blessings as inheritances. Uh, we think of them as kind of something God's is going to give us directly. Mm. But, but when you look at the ancient world, that's not how they viewed their eternal blessings. Eternal blessings in the ancient world were also something that they were to inherit. So when you read the Bible, it constantly talks about the children of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob uh, recognizing that God gave them land and that land was for them and for their children to inherit. If you just pay attention to the word inherit, it shows up so often in scripture. In connection. And yeah, and the children are to inherit the land that God gave to Abraham as part of his covenant. Hmm. Um, and that's also true of priesthood. That priesthood is also an inherited eternal blessing. And, and so that you have to inherit it um, from your ancestors in order to, to possess it. Um, and so, so that's kind of a foreign idea, um, because of a lots of different reasons, I think, but, but, um, but we don't really think of priesthood as an inheritance because today we get priesthood through a chain of authority. You know, it doesn't have to be your father. It could be any, you know, person. So the big distinction that you're making note of is in the past, it was very common that an inheritance was this family matter. And it was connected and tied to my dad had this and he's passing it down. And then a curse could be a cutoff of receiving that inheritance. If you don't receive it literally, then you have nothing to give to your posterity. We now today look at inheritance sometimes or or a curse or a disconnection of I'm going to get my authority of the priesthood, for example, through 
some is more of through a line of authority versus an inheritance. Right. Correct? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So so looking at land and priesthood particularly those two things and the reason why I'm highlighting those two things is because those are two of the great promises of the of the covenant that God made makes with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and and I think the same promises he makes with us today in the covenant because he promises that we'll receive kingdoms, thrones, principalities, so this idea of a of a kingdom or land and you know all powers, all heights, you know all heights and debts and so the idea that you'll have priesthood whereby you can rule and mm. reign as a king and queen over yeah. your land, right? That's part of God's eternal promises. Mm. But um, what we have missed, I think, is that those promises are put into the context of family ceilings. So, so the idea of inheritance then becomes uh, central, I think, to the theology um, of the old world the so the I think the Old Testament and the New Testament I think uh, address this. So Paul in Romans chapter eleven, he kind of addresses this idea. Even though he's basically saying it doesn't matter what lineage you are, you can come into the church. But he says, but don't forget, right, that there is a family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that there is this this inher- this lineage that you need to be like tied to, right? And so we do talk about in the church these ideas of adoption. Um, you know, being adopted into the the family of Abraham. Um, And sometimes we've, I think we allegorize that more than what the ancients would have. I think they they understood that somehow we we actually need to be part of that family so that I can inherit what that family has. Tell me if this is in connection or not. And maybe I'm going off on this and we can figure this out. But when Jesus says you must be born again, and he is like in a Mosiah chapter, is it chapter two or three, where he's like, he's the father and the son, mm-hmm. right? He's the father of the covenant. You're now making this covenant, which Abraham, the covenant he's making is with Jehovah, right? He's making it with who then is Jesus. It's that same lineage. Like the lineage is not just through Abraham, but through Jehovah, through him. You are my son. You're taking upon my name. You're going to yep. inherit my kingdom. Yep. Is that the connection? Am I off on that? Yeah, no, I think that, so So that that's how I think we typically view it, right? Is that that I'm going to bind myself to, to Jesus Christ and inherit eternal blessings from him. I think that's true, but I think that we're skipping all the generations in between, right? In the sense yeah. that in the sense that Jesus is placed at the head of the whole human family and that we have my parents who our temple rituals tell me I'm now the heir because I'm sealed to my parents. Yeah. Right? And they're sealed to their parents and on and on and on right? Back to Adam, back to Christ, yeah. back to the Father. And this idea that we are heirs through our families, but ultimately back to Christ and the Father, because that's the source of all the blessings, right? Wow. So this is so foundational. It's it's almost like it's important to take this as a reframe of what, in connection to a curse, mm. that the breaking of the curse is almost a disconnection to the covenant, Right, it's more of a covenantal curse. Is yep. that what you're saying? Well, yeah, it's certainly a, it's it's a you're being because of because you have broken the covenant, right? You're now severed or cut off from the inheritance. Um, so, for example, um, again, thinking of land and priesthood as being the two blessings that are inherited. When you look at the curse of Cain in the Bible, um, it literally all it says is because he has killed his brother. The Lord says that you shall be cursed from the earth. Mm. That's the curse of Cain. The inheritance. The inheritance of land, right? Mm. And so you can't, you can no longer be an heir of this earth, which is to be, a, which this earth is meant to be a celestial kingdom. So you cannot inherit a piece of land on this celestial kingdom anymore. You're going to have to be a fugitive and a vagabond, right? No longer a prince in the kingdom of God, right, of this earth. And so so Cain and his family go and they establish their own government and they establish their own, you know, kingdom, but it's not God's kingdom, right? Mm. It's it's like the first Gentile kingdom that we have in scripture. Um, but the idea is that, that you're cut off from the inheritance. Um, it, but if Cain loses the inheritance, then that means that anybody who continues to claim their blessings through Cain can't. It's not the same connection. They don't have that connection anymore. They don't get the mm. blessings because Cain doesn't have it to give to their posterity. 
Now that can, you can see how that could easily become a racist thing. Yeah. Because, because people will say, well, that family is cursed, right? They've been cut off. Um, but we'll get into, I guess, the details of, of why it doesn't, like how racism can sneak into that, but it doesn't have to be racist mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. in the sense of, of profiling. Uh, because of someone's, you know, attributes. But doesn't in that verse when he does curse Cain, he does have the clause of if, but if you do repent. Yeah. And I don't know, I can't have it memorized, but yeah. I think that there's a lot of assumptions that we might place on that. Right. Of uh, first of all, he gives there's no way back. There's no way back. Yeah, yeah. But it does it in the verse. Yeah. If you repent, he can come back. Yeah. He could come back. Is that yeah. right? That's what we get in in Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible. Right. This idea that the if you do well, you know, the Lord is offering him a way back if he will, you know. If he, if he I think chooses. This is probably before he kills Abel though, right? It's like basically the conditions of the covenant. Yeah. I'm just saying that there, in just adding to this argument of the idea that it's a covenantal curse. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's tied to a covenant. And then once you don't keep the covenant, you're cut off from the covenant. And that's what the whole book of Mormon is. He's trying to re- connect that family, yeah. the Lamanites, right? Yeah. It's written to the Lamanites so they can reconnect that covenant, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So you think about the Lamanite curse in the Book of Mormon. Again, if you read it very carefully, it just says that they'll be cursed from the presence of the Lord. And um, which, which I think that's, you know, we got cursed from the earth in the case of Cain, but Cain also himself actually responds to the Lord and says that you have cut this day you basically have cut me off from before thy face or before the presence of God. So he understood that being cut from the land is also being cut from the priesthood, which allows you to enter into the presence of the Lord. And so Cain recognizes that he's lost his inheritance of the blessings of the covenant. And, um, and hmm. so that same thing happens with the Lamanites. The cursing of the Lamanites is that they're cursed from the presence of the Lord. They don't get to have the the covenants and the ordinances that allow you to enter into his presence because they've rejected them. And naturally you're saying, let's say in real life today, if if I'm a member of the church and I don't keep my covenants, I am then disconnected from the covenant, right? And then if I continue to have posterity, they will no longer be born into that covenant. Right. Right. Yeah. And so it's possible for them to make a covenant and make and reattach the covenant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's the good news. There is a way back, right? Either your ancestors repent and reconnect themselves to the covenant so that the inheritance can throw, flow through your family again. Or if they refuse, then, then you bind yourself to somebody who will offer you that inheritance, hence the idea of adoption. But, but, but what we're losing in the, in the discussion is this idea of, of inheritance, mm -hmm. that children inherit the blessings of the kingdom from their parents and their grandparents, and that that needs to be flowing in their family. Um, but if they don't, if it's not flowing in their family, then they either have to find it some other way or get their family to repent. And the Lord offered both of those options so that there is nobody who's ever going to ever have to be cut off, right, yeah. if they don't want to be. So where do you feel that the misinterpretation potentially in the book of Abraham what do you think is the origin of that? How, like, and I know we've talked about it to a degree, but let's let's kind of take it back to where I think a lot of this has come from, right? Is the interpretation through potentially, as you said, through world different worldviews? Can we talk more about that? What, how does that look, and how could that? How do we? How did that start to get it to where there is the assumption that the church has now said is it disavowed the curse of Cain? This is not right. It is not. Uh, black people are not cursed because of the curse of Cain. We want to make it very clear that we disavow that that um, that teaching. So where do we? Where is it possible that we where we did get off track? I mean, I've even seen videos where people they're like, "It's just how it is." He's even taught, you know. Um, but the church has corrected that. Where is yeah. what's the origin of it? Yeah, should we talk about that? Yeah, no, I think it's fine. I I think the origin can be a couple of different um, thoughts. One is that that um, I think that when you, when you see, for example, in the book of Abraham, that the Pharaoh, Abraham says, the Pharaoh is of that lineage whereby he cannot have the right of priesthood, right? So the priesthood is not in his lineage 
because the book of Abraham keeps asserting, because he, the Pharaoh, is a descendant of Ham, and from the Bible we learn that Ham was cursed by Noah. Um, and we don't all have all the details about what happened. Um, we have some mentioned, but it's kind of nebulous, and there's a lot of interpretations about it. But, but, but needless to say, all we all we need to really kind of focus on is the idea that that when Noah cursed Ham, it actually in the Bible says he he then cursed his Ham's son Canaan. But I think that makes the most sense when you think of it in in the realm of Herons. inheritance, right? Yeah. That that all of Ham's posterity, because of something that Ham did, now all of Ham's posterity, I think Canaan is focused or singled out in this moment because in the Bible, it's all about the Canaanites. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so they're kind of using that as a an emphasis or like an emphasis. But, but, um, but I think the idea is that all of Ham's descendants, once, once Ham gets cut off, whatever he did, then all of the descendants then have lost the inheritance through Ham. Mm. And so... So then it talks about the Pharaoh of the book of Abraham not having the right because he's to of show, that lineage. To show through the lineage that right. you're connected to the covenant. Right. Right. Because the Pharaohs claimed that they have the blessings through Ham. Hmm. And, but then Abraham says, well, I can show you in the records. I have the records that show that Ham was cursed and therefore Ham's posterity can't claim those blessings through Ham. Hmm. And so they have to obtain it some other way. So the Pharaoh is described as a righteous man in the in the Pearl of Great Price or in the Book of Abraham. So he's righteous, yet he can't have the priesthood through the realm or through the lineage that he's trying to claim it from. Ah, and so so Abraham is having to say, "Well, look, um, that's that's not going to happen that way. Um, either you know, either we're going to have to get Ham, who's dead at this point, right, to repent and change, and then we can." make the connections that we need to, or the Pharaoh would have to get the priesthood through some other lineage. I mean, Abraham's own life is a good example of that. You know, his own father had rejected the covenant. Mm, that's and, right. From the very beginning verse. Yeah. And so he can't obtain the priesthood as an inheritance from his own father. And that's what his desire was for the very, very first few verses. Like he, his desire was to have the blessings of the fathers, right? Right, right. So, Knowing that his dad was disconnected from it. Yeah. Yeah, so who does he get it from, right? He has to seek out somebody else, and so he goes to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek gives him the blessings of the priesthood and the blessings of the covenant. And and so was, I, you know, it's not stated, but was that an adoption, right? In the sense that Abraham is now a Melchizedek's son because his own father isn't in the covenant anymore? I don't know, I'm speculating, but... But Melchizedek had the authority to give it to him. Yeah, and and it seems to be, again, anciently that, that those were family structures. Um, and there's a great book called um, Kinship by Covenant. Mm. And the whole notion of covenant in the ancient world was to create kinship where there wasn't one. So you think of marriage, right? You're not kin, mm. but as soon as you mm. get married, now you're family. But, and, but but I think too, though, we have to con consider, like, you know, people always talk, Christ is at the top of the covenant and we are part, it, there's three pieces of it, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the correct way of looking at it yeah, even I anciently? Mean, Right, because a lot of times we look at the covenant as, oh, I'm going to be sealed to my spouse, but we're also sealed to Christ in His covenant. Yeah, through through the sealing, right? Yeah. Hmm. So, for example, uh, in the Bible, we we read this. This is in Genesis 28, three and four. God Almighty bless thee, Jacob, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, the land which God gave unto Abraham. So God's saying to Jacob, I'm going to bless you with the land that God gave to Abraham, but you're going to inherit that land that he gave to Abraham, right, from Abraham, because that's his, his grandfather. Uh, this is Exodus 32. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou, God, Swearest by thine own self, and say, say, saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, and all this land will I, that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And so, so the land is not just for time, but it's also a land that, that their seed will inherit forever. And so there was this understanding you know, among them that, that they're going to inherit this over um over e into eternity. Um, and again, it's because they understood that the earth itself would become 
a celestial kingdom. So, um, but in addition to that, um, we also have um, the idea that it's not just about inheritance, right? Because you can be an heir, but a, a wicked son. And, and so, so the Lord has included in his laws of inheritance the idea that, that you can't just inherit because you're a literal child of somebody. You have to inherit because you are also faithful. Interesting. Right? And That's so, so interesting. So, Which lame in the limb fits that. Yeah. It's not just, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Leviticus 20, ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them that the land, whither I bring you to, uh, sorry, that the land, whether I bring you to, to dwell therein, spew you not out. Um, and, and the idea, and then he goes on to say, uh, but I have said unto you, you shall inherit the land of even those around you if you're faithful to me. Right, and you will possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Um, and then Joshua fourteen nine, surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. But the evil doer, this is uh, Psalm the Psalms, uh, the evil doer shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth, right? That's oh, inherit. It's yeah. all over the place. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, yeah. everywhere. And I think that huh. that idea, again, is this, it, it's also, and I'll just kind of read a couple of passages from Joseph Smith's revelations where it kind of shows up. So we have in section 26 of the Doctrine and Covenants, blessed are the poor who are pure in heart, for the fatness of the earth shall be theirs, and their generations shall inherit the earth from generation to generation forever and ever. Um, so, so we have concepts of inheriting land, not only in the Bible, but it's also in Joseph Smith's revelations, and the idea that you have to be faithful in order to qualify as one who should inherit. And then the idea that if you break your covenant, then you, you get cut off. So we have that in, uh, for example, um, section 64, the rebellious shall be cut off out of the land of Zion and shall be sent away and shall not inherit the land. Um, and then we have even in section 121 where Joseph uh, curses those who are persecuting the saints. And it goes on to say that they, that's actually the Lord cursing them. It's his voice in the section 121. He curses them. And he actually says that, that they shall not have the priesthood, neither they nor their posterity from generation to generation. So it's so the we, same type of connection. Yeah. So this, the... this idea that if you lose the priesthood, that means your children lose it. So think before you persecute <laughs> because it affects a lot of people. Now, does the children always have to be without, right? Do they, are they always or like forever banned? Well, it depends on what the child does now. If they say, if they maintain their relationship with their parents, the, the one who got cursed, then, then yes, they have maintained a curse in their own family. But if they, um, uh, if they want the blessings, they either have to get their ancestors to repent and rejoin the covenant, or again, they have to find the inheritance through someone else. Um, Again, that's just kind of how it operated in the ancient world. And I think that seems to come through in some of Joseph Smith's revelations. And that's certainly what's going on in the book of Abraham. So with the book of Abraham, let's, is it okay if we read that? I mean, because yeah. I think that it's important to look at where, um, where there's the disconnection. Or what is it what, that it says and what are the p potential things that people assume? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. So we're looking at, was it verse 27? That where, where you see this, right? 26? Pharaoh, being a righteous man, established mm -hmm. his kingdom and the judgment, his people wisely and justly all his days, seeking earnestly to imitate that order established. So here's Pharaoh, uh, basically through idolatry, imitating the priesthood to a degree, established the fathers in the first generations in, these, in the days of the first patriarchal reign, even in the reign of Adam and also Noah, his father. So he's making the argument of he's, he's not tied to it, right? He's going, is that what we're saying right here? 
So, yeah, so the whole idea in the book of Abraham is that Pharaoh, even though he's a righteous man, can't inherit the priesthood through Ham because as Abraham is attest- or asserting right through, because he has the records, he can show that, that no, Ham was cursed and therefore anybody who's a descendant of Ham can't inherit priesthood the, unless they fix things, right? They have to fix it first, but they haven't fixed it yet. And so, so Pharaoh doesn't have a right to it. Um, That's what he's saying. So when people read this, what is the what is the difference between what's said versus what are some of the assumptions that are common? Right. So I think that once you once you see that that a curse affects a family, because again, if you lose an inheritance that you you can no longer pass it down to your kids, suddenly then people start making assumptions about, oh well, then I guess if you are a descendant of Ham. Um, then you can't have the priesthood. Well, there's a couple of problems about that, right? That that that's true for Pharaoh. He's a descendant of Ham. Abraham is saying it. You're a descendant of Ham. You can't have it. Um, but the reason he can't have it is a couple of fold. One, because he keeps claiming that he's getting it from Ham. Yeah. Right. But Ham doesn't have it to give. Th- well, um, that's important. Right. That's the, probably the biggest part, right? Yeah. He's saying I got it from Ham. Ham doesn't have it to give. That's really the reason why he can't have it. Right. Not just because Ham was a certain type of person. You see, because right. I know that. Or even did, that his children are certain kinds of people. Yeah. Right? It, it, he just can, didn't, he just did not have it. Didn't have it. Yeah. And so, so you can be a righteous descendant like the Pharaoh was. He's obviously the Lord saying, I love you. You're righteous. Right. But the way my laws work, that it, you have to inherit priesthood and you can't inherit it through him right now. Yeah. Right. And so. So we got to have to figure something else out. The thing that I think is really important to note in the scriptures that the book of Abraham emphasizes over and over again that Abraham had the records. He knew the genealogies because he had the actual records. And he was saying that because the records have come into my hand, I know that the right of the priesthood has come down through the fathers to me, that there is an inheritance that, that I am following, unlike the pharaohs who are claiming it through him. And so... The same thing happens in the book of Ezra in the Old Testament. When they rebuild the, the temple, they need to reconstitute the priesthood. But who are the heirs of the priesthood? And so they ask the people to bring their records and say, show us that you are actually a descendant of the old priests and that you actually have an inheritance of priesthood. And according to that passage, or let me read it to you. Yeah. So in Ezra chapter 2, They could not show their father's house. In other words, they couldn't show their lineage and their seed, whether they were of Israel. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, were they, as polluted, put from the priesthood. Now, that's strong language to say, because you couldn't prove it, you're polluted. (laughs) It's the same thing as saying because you couldn't prove it, you're cursed, right? Um, but but the idea is that they were not allowed to function in the priesthood because they couldn't prove the inheritance of it through their records, their genealogy, as it That's says. That's very interesting. Um, so I think that um, the... Yeah, go ahead. So today, most people receiving the priesthood after the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they don't receive it through lineage. They receive it through someone who has authority that it's documented in a similar way. But you're saying anciently, it was mostly given through lineage. And that's what he's questioning here, right? Whereas you got to show it, you got to show the lineage. Yeah. But for us today, it would be something like, show me your priesthood authority line, right? Yeah. And for them, it was usually just through parent to son, to son you know, through their actual blood. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this, again, yeah, there's exactly right. There is this idea in the ancient world that land and priesthood were inherited rights. And those are eternal blessings, land, aka a celestial kingdom and priesthood, you know, aka a royal and high priestly authority, right? To rule in a land. Um, Those were to be received by inheritance. Um, and, and so the question of like what happens in church history becomes interesting when you, when you have that mindset, right? That this idea of inheritance, um, because 
this is the and you're saying the or the original standard of what this was in scripture, right? Yeah. And and so and the reason why I think that's really important is just to recognize that the scriptures aren't looking at race at all mm. in the sense that all they're concerned about is did you break the covenant and can you inherit it right from your ancestor? Um and and so I think that the when you recognize that is happening in the scriptures, then it doesn't have to be considered racist. Um, all all you're judging at that point is whether covenants were kept or not. Mm. And the what is the fallout from having broken a covenant? Mm. The fallout is that your children now can't inherit it because you don't have it to give. Directly. It, right. Mm. Unless there is a solution. And so I think the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ that Joseph Smith restored is that it includes the solution, right? Which is that, that the Lord is allowing us to repair our family lines and to work in behalf of our ancestors so that they can repent and recommit to the covenant. And because if you stop and mm. think about it, if you stop and think about it. Ooh, it's so merciful. Right. If you stop and think about how uh, the blessings have flown, if, they, if they're supposed to to flow through your family, then all of us are cursed because mm. we've all come through lineages that have broken the covenant. Scattered. And yeah. And so we've yeah. gone through a great apostasy. So I cannot inherit the priesthood from my ancestors because they don't have it to give to me. Mm. Um, Whoa. And, I, and I can't inherit land from my ancestors because they don't have it to give because they broke the covenant somewhere in that you know, in the past. Well, it makes me think of second, uh, uh, section two, right? When, when Moroni is talking to Joseph Smith and he says, if it were not so, the world would be, uh, the earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. Is, yeah. is that in reference to that? Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the way I think it's stated in the Bible is that the whole earth will be smitten with a curse, curse right? <laughs> the whole earth. I can't come cursed. back to this world yeah. that is this way. My presence can't be there. Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying that without me connecting these lineages, these families back to the covenant, then there was no point of this earth even existing in the first place. Yeah. If I don't send you Elijah to allow you to repair your family, then everything's cursed. All the families of the earth are cursed. Why? Because we've all come through a great apostasy. We've all been severed through from our inheritance somewhere in our chains. And, um, and so the Lord's like, I want you to be able to receive the blessings that I have offer you. But God's a God of law, you know? He doesn't just ignore his law. And, and again, he wants us to do this as a family. He doesn't want us just to get, go get eternal life by ourselves, right? He wants us to think about our ancestors and our fathers and, and reconnect them and reconnect ourselves to them so that we can inherit these blessings. And, and, the, and the verse that says, um, what's the verbiage? That they, without us, cannot yes. be made perfect. Right, and we understand that because yeah. they need us to do the work for them in the temples. But it goes on to say that we, without them, cannot be made perfect. And why is that? So either, some ways of thinking about it, like either um, we can't be made perfect unless we're doing good works, right, for them, which is how some people might interpret that. But I think it also means that you cannot be made perfect without them because without them, you don't have anything to inherit. Mm -hmm. You need them to have the blessings to give to you. So you cannot be made perfect, or in other words, you cannot inherit eternal life without your ancestors we need also inheriting it. And, and, and the question is, who's your ancestors? What, what, so again, what if they choose not to make the covenant? That's the natural question. That's the natural question. Well, that's when you either plead with them to repent and you get them eventually to repent, or you have to find another avenue to inherit eternal life. I find this so fascinating because it just, again, shows the character of God, of how merciful he truly is through the generations, not just to the individual. And it makes me think of the prodigal son. Yeah. He loses all of his inheritance. He wastes it. In the moment he chooses to turn back around, there's dad waiting, just waiting for him, waiting there. Right when he comes around the corner, Running to he him. runs to him. <laughs> yeah. He then how does the language? He puts a robe upon his back. He puts the ring on his hand. It's this is this kingdom, this family thing. Yeah. Right? Yep. Again, with the inheritance. Yep. 
And even though he wasted the other one, he's like, there's still something there to give. Yep. I think that's very powerful. That is powerful. <laughs> right? I love that. Even though it was wasted, there's still something to give. Yeah. It's it's like, so merciful. You can't, you can't mess up his, you can choose whether you or not you want to receive this inheritance. And even those who have lost it, that's what the temples are for, is to give, to offer, going through the third and fourth generation, as he promises Abraham, to reestablish this covenant. Even the Book of Mormon itself, it's written to the Lamanites to show them the good things that God has given to mm -hmm. his to their fathers. Yeah. And I'm wondering if it, that is the inheritance that yeah. he gave them. Yeah. I gave them this inheritance and you can have it too. Yeah. And let's reestablish it. Yeah. That, and that Jesus is the Christ, right? And that um was the good things that he gave to his their fathers. And that and that they may know the covenant. They may know the covenant. That they are not cast off forever. They're they, cast off. Ooh. Why are they cast off? Because the covenant's been broken, but not forever. This is the be most beautiful story of all time, yeah. man. Yeah. And it's through the new and everlasting covenant, which is what the whole Book of Mormon establishes. When Jesus comes back again, he gives a sermon on the mount. Blessed are those who are peacemakers. They will inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> then her, so the biggest reframe is considering a curse, connecting it to the word inheritance. Mm. That's one of the biggest things that I think can make a shift in the perspective when it comes to priesthood or priesthood curse or anything yeah. that God has given away for us all to reconnect back to the covenant, yeah. inheriting it, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so I want to be clear in this conversation. So we're talking, we're, what we're trying to do is just show the mechanics in the ancient world and the ancient scripture about what generational curses are and how they operated because it wasn't an inheritance thing. That doesn't explain why we had a modern ban. And, and I don't have a good answer for that. Um, and, and I think that, um, but it does help us to see um, uh, a couple of things. One, I think it helps us to see that um, um, it helps us to see that the modern priesthood that is being given to us, you know, because we can't inherit priesthood from our ancestors, because we've all come through a great apostasy, the Lord in his mercy has sent his authority to the earth through angels, given it to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, and told them to dispense dispense it right get it out there and so we we find ourselves following chains of authority or lines of authority through the church an ecclesiastical line of authority mm -hmm. that that we can receive the authority of god but i think that um that what the lord is teaching about the temple is that that if you want all the blessings of the gospel to last, he says in section 132, verse seven, that unless you take all the ordinances and covenants that you've made in this church, unless you take them to the temple, as it were, and get them sealed up by the Holy Spirit of promise, all of your covenants and ordinances and ordinations have no efficacy, virtue, or force in and after the resurrection. That's the kind of the wording of the Lord in section 132, verse seven. Mm. Nothing's gonna last in and after the resurrection unless you take all the things you're doing as a church and seal it up in the temple. But when we go to the temple and we seal up everything, we organize it into a family. Structure. That's right, we do. And so I think what the Lord is trying to say is, if you want your priesthood to be eternal, then it has to be an inherited priesthood through your ancestors go repair your family. I'm, I'm giving you priesthood. I'm giving you priesthood through angelic ministry. Now go link it back. Now go link it back so that it can become permanent Ooh, in the eternal scheme of things. Right? That's so powerful. The idea of, because that's what I think that maybe might be the disconnect of, it wasn't given through lineage, but that's the point. Now we're, well, now that's not the point, but it wasn't given through lineage, but now we'll go back, the temple is there so that we can connect it back to the lineage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. And 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 make that, you know, again fulfill that part of God's law, which is, this is a family affair, right? This is family exaltation, not individual exaltation. And um, um, 
Huh. And I love, like in the early days of the church, I think they understood this a little bit better because they understood that my eternal life is dependent upon me being able to inherit the blessing. So I'm going to go seal myself to whoever I can that I know is going to have the blessing. So they were they were ignoring their own posterity or their own ancestors. And they would seal themselves to Joseph Smith or they'd seal themselves to you know, Brigham Young or others. There was this widespread adoption in the church because everybody just wanted to be sure that they, they're inheriting the blessings. But then Wilford Woodruff stood up and said, um, we're going to change this. Because right now we're just ignoring our families. We're just like, I'm going to go steal myself to whoever, yeah. right? And he says, I want you to seek out your own ancestors and bind yourself to them and, and trust that many, if not all of them, are going to repent and, and reconnect themselves to this covenant. And that you're going to be okay. In other words, don't worry about the ancestor who may not ever return to the covenant. We can, we can adopt around that person, right, eventually, but... But just seek out your own mom and dad and your grandparents and your great grandparents and bless their lives so that you can then be blessed through them. Right. This is what Alma does in the Book of Mormon. I mean, literally, like he's going back to the lineage. He's going back to the Lamanites who are then reconnecting back to the families. Like King Lamon, I get I think of as an example, right? Like yeah. They were they lost connection and he connects it back. Mm. And um and just the thought of, I will show you that the tender mercies of the Lord are upon all those who are. Yeah, the, that, uh, yeah, basically that follow him. Mm -hmm. And connected to the covenant. And you see that. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm just, I'm learning right now. Like, yeah. I'm not saying that's exactly the word for word what you're saying. I'm just, I just, I'm connecting these dots of example after example in the Book of Mormon where you see this main, uh, like this objective right to go get the families back yeah and connect them back yeah let me uh share another passage from the book of mormon here's another passage from the book of mormon that i think really um applies to this idea where okay so remember that in second e5 5 the lord says that layman and you know lemuel are cursed and the re the wording says um Inasmuch as they will not hearken unto thy words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. That word cut off is curse language. So severed from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they were cut off from his presence. So, so being cut off is severed from the family tree, the inheritance. That's, that's the curse upon Laman and Lemuel. And then... Interestingly, in 2 Nephi um, 5, verse 23, it says, And cursed shall be the seed of him that mixeth with the Lamanites' seed, for they shall be cursed even with the same cursing. Now, what does that mean? And then Alma says it this way, Alma 3, verse 9, And it came to pass that whosoever did mingle his seed with that of the Lamanites did bring the same curse upon his seed. So, because they don't have the covenant. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, that's exactly right. That the idea of mingling seed is if you, if you put yourself like a, anybody who basically joins with Laman and Lemuel who've been cut off, if you uh, mingle yeah, with their seed yeah. and you become part of their family, mm, you don't have the connection. You don't have the connection. You don't get the inheritance because Laman and Lemuel doesn't have to give it to you. So now you've cursed yourself by, by becoming a child of Laman and Lemuel through mingling, right? yeah. through adoption or, or well, you know, family stealing, whatever. But, um, and so um, Alma, third, Alma chapter three, verse nine clarifies this. And it says, um, um, it's not just intermarriage. It's not just marrying into Lamanite families that causes the issue. It says that they might not mix and believe in incorrect traditions which would prove their destruction. Therefore, whomsoever suffereth himself to be led away by the Lamanites were called under that head. If you allowed yourself to be persuaded that Laman and Lemuel are the true heirs and you mingle with their seed, you are called under that head, meaning they're that your father now. 
And if and if they're your father, mm. but they're cut off, then you you've cursed yourself because you can't inherit what they don't have to give you. So the Book of Mormon is making it clear that again, this is all about inheritance, um, not about race. It's not about you know mingling seed and you know suddenly your skin changes color. Well, I guess the the elephant in the room for that particular verse section that um, that I feel that I've heard misunderstood is because he said a skin of blackness was put upon them, right? And I'm, and I know that there's, and maybe we don't need to go too deep into it, but I think that that might be where the assumptions made, right? Yeah. Am I wrong in that? Like, and I mean, maybe we don't know the exact interpretation. What do you have? You studied that a little deep, more deeply? Yeah, I've, uh, not personally. Um, there's been plenty of research about the skin and blackness, and there's different uh, views of how that can operate in the ancient world. Um, and so I think there's some good, good rational answers about, um, what skin of blackness actually might mean, right? We've, we've certainly attributed it to a racial idea, but, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's how they understood it anciently. And so, so I don't want to go into it in detail right now, because like you said, yeah. it's not something that I think that's not what my study was kind of focused on, but, but I think that, uh, certainly you have to address the issue of what that means. Okay. Um, so my my particular focus has been on dressing. What does it mean yes. to have a lineal or generational curse? I think that what we need to say is that yes, they do exist in Scripture, but they're not race based. They're not it's the same family. Yeah, the, it's it is basically the idea that um, a descendant can be considered cursed because they just can't inherit what their ancestors don't have. That's as simple as it is. Mm. And, um, and so what that means um, in how we interpret scripture, right? We have to be careful that we're not uh, overstepping some boundaries and attributing racist causes or racist ideas. Because for the ancients, it was all about covenant keeping or not covenant keeping and, and, then, and then how that affects your posterity. And that was the overall, overall purpose of it. And maybe some of our worldview could affect the way we see it. I don't know. I don't know. And, 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 I, and I, I respect that, um, you know, wanting to stay what you know, where you know. I don't, we don't want to speculate is what I'm trying to say. Um, is there anything else that you would want to add? I mean, I, from what I'm catching from this is it, to some degree, if we're not careful, we can look at history, we can look at the text, and we can say one of two ways, either Joseph Smith, it was coming out through his interpretation of the, his worldview, or we could go to the extreme and ignore it completely. But you're, off, you're saying we should look at what, a, what an actual covenant curse actually means, and including this idea of an inheritance, losing that, being cut off from the inheritance of the covenant, has a huge reframe of the entire conversation, which I think is huge. Would you, is there anything that we missed that you want to add? Uh, well, there's certainly more we could add <laughs> and, and, you know, again, how does that then inform our conversations around this issue in modern times, I think is a really good conversation that we should be having. But, um, and I wish there was a good solution, um, uh, you know, but, but I think that, that requires us to keep digging and figuring out, you know, um, how to understand this. But, but I think really what I really wanted to just make sure is that people understood that that the standard works, that the scripture, especially the revelations that Joseph Smith has given us, are not full of 19th century uh, racism, that they actually reflect ancient concepts of covenants and inheritance. And that that, that, to be, that needs to be the, the discussion that we have as we talk about now, what does that mean for us today? Wow. Um, one of the things, any other places they can look to find out more information um, that you would recommend yeah. that they can find for themselves? Yeah. Well, so the, I wrote the paper. It's um, on uh, the quote, you know, the, the title is Being of That Lineage um, and basically how cursing, you know, generational curses kind of show up in the book of Abraham and what that means. And that's in, uh, published in Interpreter uh, Journal. And um, I think it's I think it's an important piece to to consider again in the bigger dialogue that yeah. we're having. Um, it is just a small sliver, but it's but it's important. Well, I'm just and I ask that because there's a lot of different sources that we can look at to get more insight on this, right? Whatever I am looking for, whatever stage of 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 you know 
understanding I'm in, I have to recognize the fact, and I always end this way. I say, look, I, I believe what you said is true. And it's really insightful to me to learn this new piece of information, but you can't take our word for it, right? And you need to find out for yourself. Until next time. <laughs>